Hello, and welcome back to Think Yourself Healthy Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Barbieri. Before we dive into this episode, I just want to remind you that if you take a screenshot that you're listening and tag us on Instagram, we'll send you a 15% off discount for the eight-week Retrain Your Brain program. Just take a screenshot and tag me at Heather Barbieri RDN. Thanks for listening and let's get right to it. Hello, everybody. On today's episode of Think Yourself Healthy, I have a very special guest, Guy Adishaw, who is here to talk to us about all things brain, everything pertaining to the brain. And for the listeners, I'm just going to be very transparent. My brain is not firing on many cylinders. So I'm really excited to have this conversation and see if I can walk away with a few little nuggets to take care of my brain in a much needed way right now. So Guy, thank you so much for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So Guy, tell us a little bit about you and what qualifies you to have this conversation, all things brain. Sure. Well, honestly, I'm not sure anything qualifies me, but I will give you a little bit of my background and my journey. So um, if I go way back and you know, I have a mantra, it's like, don't do the math because the moment you slow down and you think, when was that? It's like, those numbers are starting to get scary. So it's a little more than 30 years ago when I was in university, um, was going through an education program, but that took me uh, kind of in a parallel course with the with pre-med. And I got to see kind of the inside of the, the, the pre-med program, followed that track for a few years and, and really was not, it just didn't resonate. I mean, it was a great foundation for what came later, but what was remarkable to me was it's, it's medical school, but we're not learning anything about people. And, and that was the, the, I just couldn't square that. So the opportunity came up to actually go to massage school, which seemed utterly obtuse at the time, but mostly for me, it was just a chance to, to get away like to, a year off, right. On, on my parents. So I thought, sure whatever. Um, but within weeks of being in massage school, I was like, these are my people. Like, what are we talking about all day is we're talking about people. And, and it was everything that the medical education wasn't. And that really, I've, I've, I've never recovered from that path. I've just stayed down um, that lane for 30 plus years. So, you know, I've worked in what's called integrative manual therapies for 30 years now. Along the way, I did a, a number of, of different trainings. I became an acupuncturist, did traditional Chinese medicine for a few years. That really wasn't my thing, kind of migrated back to my orthopedic practice. Um, spent a number of years training in and teaching cranial sacral therapy. That's something that I, I really do uh, have a passion for. Um, but the parallel to my private practice, I also uh, work kind of in the integrative medicine as a consultant, helping to set up clinics. So one of my first clinics was the University of Minnesota Boynton Health Services. We started the first integrative medicine clinic in the uh, the student healthcare system, and it was fantastic success. The administration didn't think that students or faculty would really embrace it, but students for sure. I mean, it did not take very long, and the integrative clinic was the busiest clinic in the health services. It was. You know, it was really the hunger was in the population, um, but but not surprisingly, not in the administration, right? It's too, too often, how that goes, yeah. So, yeah. So so then, really, I took you know, I, I did that for about eight years, and then took the a kernel of the idea of what was the integrative program there um, out, and I started my own clinic. So that's Bhakti Wellness Center which we grew over a period of years to be one of the largest integrative clinics in the country, kind of at our peak pre-pandemic. We had 31 uh, practitioners across the, the healthcare spectrum. So, you know, to sit in a room with MDs and DCs or chiropractors um, and uh, nurses and uh, licensed uh, psychologists and social workers and uh, body workers, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, hypnotherapists, you know, this really expansive and diverse group of professionals. And to have those conversations around how would each of us approach um, patient care and, 
and and then to have those conversations respected by the different professions around the table right that was one of the requirements of of showing up at the table was the ability to respect right and we often don't expect necessarily our our licensed healthcare providers to have all that much respect for our unlicensed healthcare providers but it's just part of the culture here at Bhakti. And so we have amazing conversations, right? And to put together a care team, say around somebody's maybe somebody struggling with a mental health concern, where we have a licensed psychologist, a nurse, uh, a acupuncturist and a Reiki provider kind of make up the team and, and to watch how those four modalities, those four professionals could help a person who really their condition had not improved for decades. And then to see that person blossom because of the addition of the, you know, kind of the non-traditional modalities, you know, we call those here, we call those everyday miracles, right? They just happen every day, right? We just see the, the apparent untreatable uh, treated and people with who have had maybe again, decades, of struggling with a condition, see that condition resolve. That's beautiful. And that's something that is near and dear to my heart. I myself have uh, committed my practice to mental health and substance abuse recovery. And I think that the two kind of go hand in hand. We tend to are, you know, we're constantly looking for some sort of coping mechanism to manage all of the discomfort that we're experiencing on a regular. And what I find more often than less is that most of this is all rooted in trauma. And unfortunately, the, you know, with our current practices, especially here in the Western paradigm, we have two solutions, two, two options for people to utilize um, in terms of getting that support for mental health. And that's typically the talk therapy and medication. And so I'm really curious to hear how you and your practice uh, approach that mental health outside of just those two modalities. I know firsthand that I see individuals, like you mentioned, struggling for decades, constantly changing medications, adding medications, increasing doses, never getting the results that they're so desperate for. And so it can be really heartbreaking for these individuals who are, they just give up and more often than less, that's when they really turn to the substance use as a way to disassociate and numb out because they don't think there's any hope. They do feel fundamentally flawed because the doctor has said, do the therapy, take your meds. And within six months, you should feel better. And we're going on 20, 30 years and there's no change. So I, I really hope today that through this conversation and for the listeners listening that, you know, we can inspire some hope back into this whole idea of mental health. I think that since the pandemic, society as a whole is really suffering collective trauma from so much uncertainty and so much fear that has been generated. And this is just hijacked our nervous systems and impacting our cognitive function. And I feel very confident that you're going to be able to expand upon this. Well, I hope so. And I'm right there with you. I mean, I think like the way you phrase that, like we've been through a collective trauma and, and, and are really not through it. Right? Like we're in the midst of a collective trauma. And yeah, so yes, I mean, the, the epidemic of mental health, right now that's happening, um, we need more resources. And that's really where, um, you know, a couple, I, so I have a couple of brain health companies. So my main clinic, Bhakti Wellness Center, but then we have the Bhakti Brain Health Clinic, I have the Minnesota Brain Health Clinic, and then I have Cerebral Fit. So, and so, and Cerebral Fit is, is really about um, finding at-home solutions, right? How can we kind of take you know, in a sense, time and space out of the equation. People don't have to come to a clinic and receive a treatment in the clinic. Um, it's inefficient, both in terms of time, but also money. So we can we can deliver, you know, what uh, a service that might cost $100 in the clinic. So somebody comes once for $100. That same $100, if they had invest in a device, they could treat themselves twice a day, every day of the week. They could have 14 treatments for the price of one. Right? It's a much more efficient model. 
And so that's that's what the our company CerebroFit is based around that idea of how do we take the advances in technology that we use um, in our clinic and and deliver that to people to use at home uh, in a, in a way that again it's it's lower cost, better outcomes, right? And so. Um, and so one of the ways is just to take a step back, uh, we take, think about mental health. And if we think about like heart health, right? Like, so mental health, you go in, you talk to a professional and it is talk therapy, right? They, they ask, you know, how do you feel? What's going on in your life? What are the events of your life? What are your stressors and, and all of that? And, and then, so none of this is to devalue that at all, right? And again, is working in an integrative clinic, we, I respect every form of healthcare and every form of professional that practices. As, and, and so nothing, I don't want to say anything here today that is like an over against, this over against that, right? That, that's not the model, right? It's, it's, an, it's a both and, right? And, and an, uh, sometimes there's emerging perspectives that it's helpful to do a comparison between one perspective and an emerging perspective to, to help make sense out of it. But that comparison isn't one over the other, right? It's a both. Of so say that for all my mental health friends. <laughs> yeah. And, and I really appreciate that transparency because I think too often, unfortunately, Western healthcare providers, they really tend to be uh, attacked in, in a sense, you know, with their approaches and and the unfortunate circumstances. But the reality is these doctors, they went into this for a reason. Healthcare providers don't go into it, you know, uh, they go into it because they want to help people. And unfortunately, that gets conditioned out of us <laughs> because we have time limits and we have quotas that have to be made. And so it really dehumanizes the patient-provider relationship. And I think that that's where things have really bis been misinterpreted um, along the way, if that makes any kind of sense. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I'll just share a, like a personal story. Is a dear friend of mine um, you know, rushed into the ER. They did an MRI. They found out that he had a mass on the brain. He needed to have emergency surgery. Um, they did the emergency surgery. He just got out today. He's doing great, right? So that's 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 where we needed our allopathic system, right? Like he needed every bit of care and technology of every surgeon, every primary care doctor, every nurse, everybody that, that saved his life, right? He needed that. He was not going to get help at my brain health clinic. Not the life-saving help that he needed in that moment. Yeah. Exactly. Now, in his recovery, can we help him? Sure. Right. But on the flip side of that, you know, just the other day, yesterday, I had a conversation with one of my dementia clients who I've not spoken with for probably eight months. So she's been in the program close to a year. I could not believe the person that I was talking to, how much she has changed. It was absolutely remarkable to see her just to just converse with me as if there were no problem. You know, eight months ago, she couldn't make it to the end of a sentence without losing track of what she was talking about, right? And, and we had a full conversation, just like everything was fine. I mean, so much has changed in her life. So we can say, like, but there, is no, there is no allopathic clinic for her to go to and have that treatment, right? And so this is where we, we need both sides of the system, right? What, what we do in my clinic, we can help people with a neurodegenerative disease move towards health. But I can't help my friend who's got a tumor on his pituitary gland, right? So we need both sides of it. So, so, no, so no, um, no like over against anybody. It's, a, it's an embrace of all of it. It's, it's what... It's what do you need where you are in your healing journey, right? What's the, what's the key that opens your lock? And that's, that's what we need. So we need all the keys to open all the locks, right? Yeah. So, um, so when it comes to, to the brain health side, 
the way the way I think about it is again, if you're thinking about heart health, if you went to your cardiologist and your cardiologist said, "Well, how do you feel? Tell me about your relationship with your mother. You know, how when was the last time you got hugged? What do you do on Valentine's Day?" Right? And then and then wrote up a prescription to give you a medication, like you would not be like, "Oh, I like this cardiologist." Right? You'd be like, "No, doc, can you do a calcium scan of my heart and tell me how much blockage I have in my coronary arteries, right? Like that, that we just expect that from our cardiologist. It'd also be nice if they asked how my relationship with my mom was, but that would not be the, the level of care we would want. So the, what we want here from a brain health standpoint is the same thing, right? We, we often say in kind of mental health, we're the, the only profession that doesn't image the organ they treat. And so, you know, in our clinic, we use um, QEEG or quantitative electroencephalograph to do our neuroimaging. There's all kinds of reasons for it. Each one has its own thing. Again, like my friend who went in, he needed an MRI. A QEG was not going to help him, right? But in the aftermath, when we want to look at his brain function, not his anatomy, but his brain function, an MRI isn't going to be helpful, but a QEG would be. Right. So it's, it's like blood tests, right test, right time. Right. So when, so when it comes to mental health, what we do is a QEG and what's called an ERP, event related potential, to look at the brain function. And for us, our basic disposition is dysregulation. Right. Like, what do we treat? We treat dysregulation. We could say we don't treat anxiety, we don't treat depression, we don't treat OCD, we don't treat traumatic brain injury, we don't treat trauma, we treat dysregulation, right? The organ isn't functioning in a neurotypical way. What do we do? We do our best to restore that nor nor normal or neurotypical function. If we can do that, the things called symptoms that arise from the dysregulation go away. But I don't have to have an orientation of I treat dementia or I treat a brain injury or I treat dyslexia. I regulate dysregulation. That's it. That's all I do. Right. I I love that. I love that concept. It's very simple. However, it's very comprehensive. And that is so beautiful because unfortunately, that's not the approach that we typically are handed, you know. I think that most of us have been very conditioned to this idea that our genetics are responsible for our health conditions. And as a result of that, it takes all of the responsibility off of the person from actually having to create and make sustainable lifestyle changes to set themselves up for success. And it makes it a lot easier to buy into this idea that I just need to take this pill in order to fix the genetic problem that I am a victim of because I didn't have a choice. Yes. Well, that, that, that can open a door to an interesting conversation because we can, you know, take a few steps down that road of, of what I, you know, what I generally, you know, term as compliance. Right. And, and so that is, what is the, what is the, the patient's role in the healing process? Right. And, and one of the places I, I run into it, and this happened uh, yesterday, yesterday morning, in one of my consults, uh, a person working with chronic anxiety and depression, and we're talking about using bioelectric medicine, so one of our devices to treat that, um, that, that and that to regulate the dysregulation underlying those symptomatic labels, and and you know her number one question was, well, how often will I have to do this? How long will I have to do this? The, the main concern was this seems like an imposition that I'm going to have to do this thing 30 minutes a day, you know, maybe for the rest of my life. And, and, and that struggle is like, okay. But, you know, my, and that was my advocacy is like, think of this like nutrition, right? So I tell my clients all the time is if you come to me and say, hey, guy, I'd like to get healthy. Maybe I'd like to lose 15 pounds and I'd like to lower my blood pressure. And I said, well, let's work on your diet. And so I'm going to suggest that, you know, you eat a healthier diet. And, so, and then they say, well, should I eat, you know, one healthy meal a week? 
and do that for eight weeks and then I'll be, I'll be okay. And it's like, no, how about if you eat three healthy meals a day for the rest of your life? Like, could we negotiate that? And, and, and from a nutrition standpoint, that just kind of makes sense, right? Just intuitively. It's like, oh, whenever I eat, I should eat healthy or healthier. And I should probably do that for the rest of my life. And, but when it comes to, you know, kind of more acute care, so, you know, medicine, people have this idea of like a short course, like I'll go to physical therapy for six weeks and then I'll be done. Or I'll take this, you know, a round of medication and then I'll be done. And there is an appreciation of what, what we're doing with Cerebral Fit is it's, it's nutrients, right? They're electroceuticals, they're nutrients. We're, we're vitalizing the organ. The organ happens to be the brain, right? You can think about doing your cardio at the gym and you're vitalizing your heart. More than that, but we could say that our heart. We're, we're working with people to vitalize their brain. And, and, and so that is like a, yeah, every day, every day for the rest of your life, as long as you have a brain and you want it to work well, you should do this. I mean that, but it's, it's a struggle, right? To recruit people into this idea of, of actually, you know, like living a healthy lifestyle, investing their resources, you know, time, money, energy, and attention in being healthy. I think, I think that that unfortunately is just part of the societal conditioning. We've been, you know, so conditioned for a quick fix band-aid type approach that, it gets very difficult for people to understand to create sustainable results. You have to take consistent action steps to get there. And it doesn't mean that it always has to be so rigid. There's still, you know, I'm a firm believer in an 80 20 rule that if 80% of the time we're applying mindfulness and being aware of the choices that we're making and the consequences that could potentially come with them that we can afford the other 20% to have the one-offs and enjoy it and not shame and guilt ourselves because that just contributes to the problem. So yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with uh, the approach that you guys are taking. Your, your clients are very lucky to have found you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so maybe it would be helpful to, for me to say a little bit about like just it, give some practical side of like, what is it that we do? I mean, I would mentioned that, um, you know, bioelectric medicine is the general area. Um, we, we treat the brain. So, so we have a couple of things like in a clinic we do it again, we typically would start somebody at doing a QEG and ERP. So we look at brain function, we get these, you know, massive reports, hundreds of pages that tell us how is one part of the brain talking to another part of the brain and, and is it talking, you know, to that part of the brain, uh, too little, too much, you know, in the wrong frequency, right? Which would be like using the wrong language, right? And so we would get a sense of how is this brain talking to itself? How well coordinated is its internal processes or uncoordinated? And then that gives us a roadmap for what kind of treatment is likely to be helpful. And then our chosen treatments, and although there are other approaches to this, but our chosen treatments are mostly in the, again, electroceutical standpoint. So we might use neurofeedback, right? So neurofeedback is a simple kind of operant conditioning. The, the system is kind of tracking what the brain is doing. It's giving the brain a, a reward, which might be in the form of a game, right? Flying a plane with your brain and, and the plane f flies straight when your brain is doing what you want it to do. And the plane goes wobbly when your brain is doing something it's not supposed to be doing. And so there's just this reinforcement, right, of, of getting the brain to move energy and information around through its various networks in a more neurotypical way. And then that leads, you know, through process of neuroplasticity, that brain rewires itself and the person, you know, comes out the other side of the neurofeedback process, um, again, with a more well-regulated brain working in a more neurotypical way and again, these things we call symptoms seem to just kind of fall away, right? So there's neurofeedback, it's a beautiful process. It's, you know, I, I feel it's a gift to sit in the clinic and, and watch a brain rewire itself live in front of my eyes. It's absolutely amazing to see, right? So that's neurofeedback. And then there's neuromodulation. 
So if, you know, if neurofeedback we can think of as a read process, the, the system is reading what's happening in the brain, nothing's going in, it's all reading. Neural stimulation is the opposite. It's a signal going into the brain, right? Instead of asking the brain to modify itself, we're putting in a signal to modify the brain activity, right? So we're saying, hey, you know, um, anterior uh, cingulate cortex, we want you to talk to the posterior cingulate cortex in a different way. Here's an example of the way we want you to, the, you know, the anterior to talk to the posterior. So we give it that signal. And, and, and the idea being is, you know, it will retrain that neural conversation and move it in the direction that we want. The brain will pick up on that and say, oh, actually this turns out this is more efficient and, and it'll adopt that, right? So we use neurostimulation and it was a, it's a, another form of treatment. Okay, so with that neurostimulation, is this something like a vibrational frequency, a specific frequency for that part of the brain or is this like a radiation-based thing? Sure, great question, yeah. So, um, so we have all the toys. So we can do um, transcranial alternating current, transcranial direct current, transcranial photobiomodulation, which is a fancy way of saying light therapy, or transcranial uh, pulse magnetic uh, therapy, right? So we've kind of got all the currents and the light and the magnetics, and we can and we can put them together. So you know we kind of mix and match for the individual person to say we want to bring in you know, a little bit of alternating current, we're going to add in some alternating current pink noise to stabilize the whole brain, maybe layer in some photobiomodulation and, and then tap all of that off with some pulse magnetic therapy to increase circulation and you know, things of that nature, right? So we kind of custom design a treatment protocol for what's happening in the brain based on that QEG and a, a person's kind of symptom profile, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And then we can actually mix in our clinic, we can mix the neurofeedback and the neurostimulation. So we can uh, be asking the brain to produce a certain frequency in a pr certain area. And then if it's, if it doesn't seem able to catch on, we can use the neurostimulation to then show that area of the brain. Here's what we want you to do. We, we'd like, you know, a 15 Hertz um, oscillation here. And then we can check to see, did, did that region pick up on that? You know, yes, it did. No, it didn't. It did a little bit, but it couldn't hold it. Then let's give it another little bit of a, a, a nudge. And so we can kind of do this um, learning paradigm with much like you might learn the piano, right? Is if somebody shows you how to play it, then you try and mimic them. And then they show you something more, you try and mimic, and then they correct you. Not quite like that, like this. We're doing that same kind of idea, but with the brain, right? You know, as you're talking, I can't help but think there's not a single person who is listening right now that would not benefit from these kind of services. And here's my thought process. With our modern day advances in technology, and specifically with you know what we've got with 5G that has been rolled out over the last two years, most people are literally sleeping with this sucker right next to their head. Many of them, I mean, it's literally, it's up underneath the pillow or it's right next to the head or on the head, you know, the table right next, a foot away. And we know that these currencies, these electromagnetic frequencies are creating massive disruption within the brain. So I'm thinking everyone needs this. Yes. Yes. Uh, so yes. So we're, we're soaking in it, right? There's, there's our Wi-Fi network and, and there's not only my Wi-Fi net, what network in my house, but if you ever, you know, just go to your, to your wife, you know, on your computer and you turn it on, there'll be like 15 networks that are in your area, right? All your neighbors have them, right? So you're, we're just soaking in this electromagnetic frequency bath. And, and, and some of them are going to be less than optimal for us, right? And, and again, not, not if it was for 10 minutes, but, when it's 24 hours a day, every day for a lifetime, for the, those of us, you know, now, people born now, this is a, just ubiquitous, right? We're, we're just saturated with it. Yes, these, these have an effect. And, and there's some good science to show what happens. Like we have some QEG data what, that shows what happens when you take a cell phone and put it next to your head, how that, how that affects your brain waves. 
right? And and it, we can just show it just as plain as day. How about the the headless the uh, the head the ear? Yeah, the the things you put in your ears. Yeah. So the nice thing about Bluetooth is it, it yeah it's the earbuds. Yep, it's a much weaker signal, so it, it doesn't penetrate as deep as the cellular signal, which is very strong, or a Wi-Fi signal, which is strong but not as strong as a cellular signal. So you're, you're you're ramping down the the power density and the and the field that it creates, and so not to say that it doesn't have any effect, but it is definitely a fraction of what you get from the phone itself. So if people were making a choice, yes, use a, a Bluetooth device and keep your phone as far away from your head as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's really great to know. I I mean, it definitely validates. I had um, author F Fistenberg on um, sometime last year, and he was the author of The Invisible Rainbow and has really done a lot to bring awareness around, uh, you know, the elect, the EMFs that we're being constantly exposed to and the consequences that are showing up in our health as a result. So I appreciate you clarifying that for the audience. Yeah, I mean, we, we had to have our clinic, um, we had to bring an engineer in to do the kind of um, work with the electrical systems of the building. Because our system, our equipment is so sensitive, we were picking up the electric fields of the, the electricity running in the walls and, and somebody would turn a vending machine on down the hall and we would see it in our equipment. So we had to put in electrical shielding to protect our equipment. And, and as, as sensitive as our equipment is, our bodies are more sensitive, right? And so we just know. Yeah, can you kind of explain to the audience what you mean by that in terms of how our bodies are sensitive? Sure, so this is one of, one of my favorite areas. I don't get to talk about this too much. <laughs> so, um, so I'll just say one of my favorite researchers in this area is Michael Levin at Tufts University, right? So. Anybody want to just blow your mind, go to YouTube and Google Michael Levin, L-E-V-I-N, bioelectricity, and see the work that he's doing there. He's, he's turning biology on its head, um, uh, which is having an impact on psychology, sociology, philosophy. Uh, the work he's doing is just astounding. But what he's, what he's showing for us, right, this isn't his intention. It's a byproduct of his work. But one of, one of the, the videos you can look for is the electric frog face. Right? And, and to me, like I show this in all of my lectures, and, and I'm, I'm chronically disappointed that, that that alone doesn't just astound people such that we never get further. But I play it for people, and, and they're just like, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't get it. But this is how profound it is, right? So what, what he's able to show, his, his team, um, was that before in the frog embryo, before the frog face is formed uh, anatomically, before the cells migrate and form an eye and a, you know, um, there's, there's an electric, electromagnetic template that shows up of what that face will look like. And then the cells migrate to that electric template and then they become the cell that is appropriate for the electric field that it migrates to, right? So it's not an, an, a cell that's gonna make up a retina that, that ends up there. It's, it's a stem cell that migrates. And then when it enters the retina field, it becomes a retina cell, right? So it's the electromagnetic field predates the anatomy, right? So this is just a fundamental importance of what, what has been theory, but he has shown it as a matter of fact, and then can manipulate it to show, to prove the theory, he can manipulate it and, and say, you know, somebody say, well, you know, make this happen. And then he can tweak the electromagnetic field and make that thing happen, right? Yeah, so it's absolutely phenomenal. So, so he's showing the, the primacy of the electrochemical gradient on what is happens not just in our anatomy, anatomy is kind of an end result, but more important is on information processing, right? And this is, this is 
an area that in Western medicine we're just waking up to. And the research he's doing, other people who are working in similar ways, the area of optogenetics, where we're, we're not looking at the hardware, so cells, uh, chemicals, you know, sodium, potassium, you know, pushing around the hardware, there's, there's the beginning of the kind of illumination of the software level, right? And this is the information that's telling the hardware what to do and what to be, right? So above our genetics is epigenetics, and that's information processing that tells the genes what to do, where, when, what not to do like that, right? So this, so we're, in Western medicine, we're just learning about this and beginning to manipulate it. And that's the work Michael Levin and his colleagues are doing and, and doing things like limb regeneration, right? Being able to get a, an animal that does not naturally regenerate to regenerate a, a whole limb, for example, right? So this is, you know, huge breakthrough in science, right? Um, so so if, we, if we look at that work and we look to see how sensitive our physiology is, and not again, not just our physiology, our anatomy, our morphology, you know, it scales all the way up, that that is running on kind of an electromagnetic or an electrochemical gradient that is about information, not parts, right? So if we really come to understand that, then we can begin to appreciate the EMF problem, right? that we have all of these electromagnetic fields that have the potential to interfere with our own electromagnetic field. And that electromagnetic field is telling our physiology what to do, right? And so when we're interfering with the information processing level, it's going to come down to the physiological level, right? It's gonna change cell morphology. What does that mean? This is a scary one, but it's just it's just a it's just an example that's attention getting, right? Is say tumor formation, right? So cancer. There's a growing understanding, not just out of, of Michael Levin's work, but broader. MIT has done some fascinating work over the last 10 years, um, you know, kind of pointing in this direction. I think Michael Levin's work is what really clinches it as a fact, not just a theory. Uh, is the difference between healthy cells and tumor cells is information processing. So a tumor is a group of cells that have lost the plot, right? So a group of liver cells that are no longer getting in the information stream that they are liver cells, right? So they revert back to being uh, in you know, single cell organisms and they start enacting the behavior of single cell organism, which is um, seeking nutrients and uh, replicating, right? They just do what any single cell will do. That's cancer. So what what we what what he's been able to show is, like you can you know in a healthy animal, take a healthy animal, um, break the communication between a group of cells, they will become a tumor. He can reestablish the communication. They will go back to being the cell they were before. He can break the communication. They will become a tumor again. And he's been able to toggle this on and off to show that th this is indeed the phenomena that's happening, right? And so, so, so we can look at, like, we don't have to look just at an EMF level. We can think of, say, plastics in the environment and how plastics become hormone blockers. And, but again, they're, they're in interrupting the information flow that's, that's above the physiology, that's telling the physiology what to do when, where, why, how, so the instruction set. They're interfering with the instruction set. So then the physiology loses the plot, right? So, so this is, this, to me, this is the greater concern of EMFs is their ability, because they're on that same, in a sense, wavelength, not literally using that word metaphorically, but they're on the same wavelength, right? They're, they're electromagnetic signals that have the potential to interfere with our own endogenous electromagnetic signaling. And that signaling is the information for how to be a human being, right? How to, whatever the cell is, right? A kidney cell or, you know, whatever we're talking about, it has 
a, an electromagnetic information system around it, telling it what to do and how to do it. And when we interfere with that, we run the risk of, of interrupting the system on that level. When we look at it on the level of physiology and we try and correct it there, we're, 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 we're off by one level. Makes so much sense. Like my mind is over here blowing up going, there's so many disruptors. There's so many environmental components that are contributing and it makes complete sense why we are seeing such a prevalence in cancer, you know, um, and despite all of the efforts that we've made technologically and physiologically and anatomically at trying to uh, get, get ahead of this, this makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious how trauma comes into the picture with this mis, you know, mis messaging or this misfiring, how, how, could you explain how that component can kind of create this picture? <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's a great question. I mean, uh, again, one of my favorite areas, areas I spent, you know, decades working in. So, you know, we, in a way we have to separate it at least into two levels, maybe three, right? If you, if you, if you let me talk long enough, we'll get into more than that, but I'll, I'll try and keep it somewhat simple. Um, so we can think of, of you know, mind, right? So, um, Van der Kolk wrote uh, the, the body keeps the score, right? It's a, a kind of a, a, you know, getting a lot of attention now as he, he, he just, you know, he did a great job of articulating something that's been around for eons, but he, he, he validated it in a, in a more scientific model, put it in more scientific language um, and, and, you know, has been able to push this forward more. So, uh, so, you know, thank you to him and, and uh, folks associated. So we can think of it in terms of mind in just conventional mind, right? Like right now, your mind, my mind, hanging out, talking. But then as we follow mind down, right, it becomes this question. And it depends now, you start to break, uh, you know, the population into different groups, or at least the academic types who like to think about these things, right? Are the people who think the mind is nothing more than an epiphenomenon of the brain, right? So it's all about the brain, which is really all about physiology, right? So there's the reductionists. And then there's the folks that, that really think mind is its own um, category, own entity, it exists. And you could maybe the comparison is a little bit like the TV and and the broadcast, like the, the, like the, the TV is the receiver that, that translates this other signal that exists beyond the TV, separate from the TV, right? Those little people aren't in the box, right? Right, so we have that model of mind where the brain is really a receiver of the signal that is mind, right? And so we have these two basic camps, there's a third camp Again, I'm going to try and keep this somewhat simple, um, but but so we can think about you know how that kind of the mind body you know relationship and and you know it's a false dichotomy because it is really continuous right as far as we're concerned right if we get out of the academics let's talk about it categorize it put it in boxes so we can draw diagrams and point if we stay with an actual human being you know we are psychophysical entities we are continually all at once that right we don't exist in parts and so you know we can think of something like trauma as affecting us you know and again which level do we want to talk on we could talk about how it impacts us you know kind of on a spiritual level and how that that just completely seamlessly comes down you know, into the psychological, right, into the mind level, and that seamlessly comes down into the body level. And in exactly the way that I just described around the bioelectric, right, that every physiological process has mind associated with it. It has local mind. And when mind on any level, right, what do we think of a tissue, like if I think of my bicep muscle, there is, there is kind of a bicep mind, right? That is telling those cells, 
what how to be a bicep and how to function and, and do all of that right but just like my body is these layers of of uh you know cells and tissue types and organelles and organs that scale up to be a human being we could say the same thing for mind right there's a mind that's all the, all the way down there at the single cell level and then that mind aggregates all the way up to something that i call my mind and then you know, many of us would say, whatever I conceive of as my mind, there is a mind bigger than my mind, right? And then whatever I conceive of that mind, there's a mind bigger than that mind. And then some point, the, the, the definition of mind kind of wears out, and we have to move into the language of, of spirituality, and we start bringing in things like soul and, and whatnot, because we stretch the definition of mind so far, uh, we need to give it up. So, um, so that, so that is to say, that's my conception. And so that's what I, I feel happens, right? When, when um, trauma happens, you know, this mind, which we optimally want to be, you know, kind of an, an integrated field, right, becomes uh, disintegrated. Parts of mind get closed off from other parts of mind. And then and then depending on what part of our bodily being that that mind is associated with, then those parts will start to function in a, in a, you know, non system optimizing way, right? Because they're disconnected from the larger whole. And, and so, you know, this is kind of the, the model of trauma, again, aggregated depends on whose model you're looking at. People have different pieces of this, right? Not everybody wants to go beyond the, the psycholo psychological level, right? They want to say like, well, that's my limit. Okay, I think we could include beyond, you know, the mere conventional mind in our model. So there's a, a very, you know, kind of simple explanation of how to think about it, but that's, that is how I approach it, you know, in my own practice. And, and, you know, might use something like cranial sacral therapy as a way to address what's happening in the, the physical being, but on that level of, of mind, not in our verbal, you know, subjective mind, but in our nonverbal instructional mind. You know, cranial sacral is a really good interface for working with that, um, uh, you know, aspect of our humanity, right? And helping people there. What I found in my practice is the bioelectric approach is, is often faster, more efficient. It's a little bit more direct and, and there's reasons for that. And, and, and again, it's a whole long conversation a, around just this piece, but I'll say like, like for me, so using something like cranial sacral therapy to treat um, a psychoemotional trauma, so early developmental, you know, childhood trauma. I've had clients who I've worked with for years, you know, five years, ten years, and and it's not that we don't make progress, but the progress is incremental, right? Take those same people, maybe that I've worked with for five years, bring them into the the brain health lab and switch over to say neurostimulation. And now we're working not through, well, through a more direct, you know, kind of electrochemical approach, again, to that, that notion of dysregulation. And you take that same person and, and they maybe improve in six months in the time that took three years. Right? And so that's been my experience is it's not a it's not a this over that like oh neurostim is better than cranial sacral um, it's they both have their place and they both have their you know their their dignity and their integrity and and a, and a depth and a, a sacredness to them but there's something to be said like my clients would say like okay guys let me see I come and see you twice a week for six years and I get this better. Or I come and see you twice a week for six months and I get four times better. 
I'll take the second one. <laughs> right. This is really fascinating. And one, so I'm going to hit you with a question that you may not be able to answer and that's okay, but the, here's where my brain went. Here's where my brain went as you're chatting. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm putting myself into a mental health facility kind of setting. And these individuals are going through group therapy type of modalities for trauma healing, where an individual is bringing up circumstances from their past. It's creating a physical, you know, a physiological response within themselves in that moment. The brain, the mind, whatever, cannot differentiate between this happening in the past and it happening right now. But then we've got the other people sitting in the room who are listening. And it has a bigger impact on some more than others. Typically, people that we would identify as like an empath, someone who is very sensing and feeling of others. And I'm curious, do you think that there's some sort of frequency that these empathic people are more tuned to that's making it have a larger physical, mental, emotional impact on them? Mm. Wow. What a great question. <laughs> I love it. Um, wow. So I'm going to give you my favorite answer. That depends. <laughs> depends. Right. So we, yeah. So I, I, the way my mind works with that is, well, which, which level of the person do we want to begin answering the question from, right? To create a mental model for how could this work? So do we want to think of them you know, do we want to think, think of people at, on a kind of um, more little mechanical level, right? And think of them the way allopathic medicine does. It's just a collection of cellular functions, right? And we could talk about it there and kind of map out how this could work. We could think a little bit bigger, you know, more as an organism level. And we could think about, so like their nervous system and what how, how might that person's nervous system be wired because of their history and, and what makes them more susceptible or not susceptible to a pattern, you know, of behavior in the environment, a, a pattern of information that, that comes to their nervous system, right? How does their nervous system just handle that? You know, so we could look at that still staying kind of in the mechanical, but we've moved from the physiological to the neurological and talking about that and kind of the, 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 you know, uh, how their motor strip, um, you know, like lays this down onto their nervous system and what, what does that turn on and turn off and like that. We can think of it from a neurological standpoint. And then we could get into the psychological and, and just say, what's going on with this person? What's their history? What might be triggers here? And then, and then you know, for any one of those triggers, we have to ask the question of, does this trigger them to become more open or more closed, right? And, and there, so there may be four or five or six or seven or 10, you know, or more um, aspects or, or psychological switches that get flipped as that person is listening to that story. Right? And all of that is kind of setting up on one level their mind, but on another level their brain and nervous system for degrees of openness and closeness, right? And, and, and then again, we could keep going, like we could get into for like the mind and then into kind of the, you know, more into the spiritual side of things, right? And, and kind of the person who's sharing, like, what are they, what is their sharing bringing into the room, right? Like what's, what's it evoking, right? Fear or compassion or wisdom or truth or, you know, kind of honesty, um, you know, what are the qualities in them that their narrative is bringing out? And then, then the, the, the spiritual aspect of the people in the room are going to resonate with those qualities, but they're also going to have some history and some reaction to it. So somebody, we might think, well, truth is good, right? So somebody's resonating with a quality, an essential quality of truth. They're bringing that into the room. But somebody else might have a terrible history with the truth. And, and so that aspect causes them to kind of shrink, pull back, shut down, where somebody else, it opens them up that, you know, so we just have to look at these just complex layers of, of information that's 
that's being manifested? And then how do the different receivers and processors in the room uh, relate to that information that's coming in? So what I'm so what I'm hearing you say is that ultimately, amongst all of these different informations, it really boils down to an energy baseline. It's it's a energy. Yeah, I think energy is a good metaphor for it, right? Let's just put it in something like energy. Yeah. Okay. So this is where, and this is kind of where we get into that whole quantum physics aspect of things and how we're all interconnected and everything is communicating. It's an ecosystem, a big, huge collective ecosystem of energetic impulses, I guess is the way I would describe it. Yes. And then if you really want to stretch your mind, um, <laughs> go, go take a look at the work of, of Dan Hoffman and his group and, and, and their conception, which I, I very much believe in. And, I, and again, like what Michael Levin is doing, and I, I certainly, I, I shouldn't say that. What I think that Michael Levin is doing, because I don't, want to presume that Michael Levin in any way thinks this is what he's doing, right? Um, but what I what I see and hope his work is leading to is an understanding of something like in Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, where we've talked about chi or prana, right? This idea of, of energy, but in those traditions, it isn't just energy, it's, it's energy and information, like it's simultaneous, right? So my sense is he's pointing out what the traditions have talked about for centuries, he's just using Western mechanisms to point to and go, oh, this really exists, right? Um, so that's my conception of it. So Dan Hoffman would say that, again, what much of the traditions have said for thousands of years, that like the, the essence of all of the great wisdom traditions, um, you know, Dan Hoffman and his group were putting together, you know, a, an academic uh, approach to say, like time and space don't actually exist. And even like the whole idea of quantum physics, nope. Like, not that it's wrong. It's just, it isn't what it thinks it is. It thinks it's fundamental, but it's not fundamental. It's, it's a user interface, right? And that, that existence uses something that looks like quantum physics as an interface, but, but it is not in any way fundamental. So if we, if we go to something like what Dan Hoffman and his group are putting forward as an academic approach that very much mirrors, and, and again, I don't want to put words in Dan's mouth, or Don's mouth, sorry, Don, um, uh, that, that he, has, he also has made the connection to kind of the great traditions and the similarity between what they're saying at the deepest, most fundamental interpretation of it, um, that they they feel like science is also getting there as well. And one of the big things has been this understanding that that time and space taken to be fundamental are now seen as not fundamental. Like they've gone past space time and and it's it's like, nope, that's out. We we were wrong. Or again, not wrong. It just it isn't we thought it was the bottom. Turns out it's not the bottom. It's it's just a user interface that's functional when that's what you need. But as soon as you pass it by, it's not functional anymore. And if you let go of it, things actually work better because you can work with the user interface for where you are and not the user interface for like, you know, again, trying to program your smart TV using your 1980s VCR. Wrong interface. Not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Right, man. You, you have an incredible way of really simplifying these very, very complex concepts for individuals to kind of grab and hold on to. Are you familiar with Edward Grant and the work that he does as a polymath? Not ringing the bell, no. I'll email you a few videos. I think that, um, yeah, I think that you'll be very much in alignment with the work that he does. Um, but basically, you you really simplified a lot of the concepts that he speaks to in a way that's really understandable. So earlier at the beginning of this interview, I asked you a question about 
qualifying yourself for this conversation. And I just have to say, I think you've done an incredible job of qualifying yourself as an expert um, in this in this realm. You're uh, you're really a brush of fresh fresh air. I have to be honest. The 31 practitioners who have the ability to work with you and be part of your team. Um, that sounds like a collective environment that I would want to exist within. And I, I really feel that what you guys are doing is um, on the brink of the, the new paradigm of healthcare that is to come. I think that people are really frustrated. They're fed up with a lot of the traditional modalities and services that are offered. And um, you guys have been, you know, ahead of the game for quite some time. And it's just now getting to come forth to more of a, a mainstream audience through things like podcast and, you know, SEOs and all that stuff, social media. Um, so so tell the audience a little more about some of the services that you guys do offer for for Brain. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. So yeah, I'll kind of stay, well, I was going to say I'll stay kind of in the cerebral fit area, but, but maybe I'll be a little bit more omnivorous than that. And just say, so within our brick and mortar, right, clinic, we do, again, the QEG brain mapping, we do the, the ERP, uh, another form of event related potential brain mapping. And then we do really the full spectrum of neurofeedback, right? And there's hundreds of different kinds of neurofeedback. So it's part of the confusion in the field. And so we decided when we set up our equipment, we wanted, again, to be kind of omnivorous. We wanted to be able to say we can do a like a single sensor, single channel, train one brain wave in one area at one time. The simplest form of neurofeedback you know, goes back you know, 50 years um, to the, the most advanced on a clinical level that, that is generally clinically available, which is a 19 channel um, Loretta, SW Loretta three-dimensional volumetric training can train hundreds of brain functions at the same time, right? So we really kind of span that, you know, in the clinic. And that's, again, because we just, you just never know what any one individual needs. There isn't a best kind, right? It's like saying there's a best key. There isn't a best key, right? It's just, it's the best key is the one that opens the lock you want to get through, right? <laughs> yeah. I love how unemotionally attached you are to to everything like it's it's such a brush of fresh air i cannot speak today it is such a br breath of fresh air because we see so many people it's my way and only my way and one thing that i preach all the time is that there is no right or wrong there's many different ways to get to the same conclusion and it's a matter of identifying What's going to be the best and most efficient route for you that you can stay on? You know, because if we can't stay on the route, then what's the point? <laughs> We're never going to get to the end goal anyway. Exactly. Yes. That, that, yes. The compliance piece, right? You got to be able to stay the path. Like I tell my clients, the, the best treatment plan isn't the one I come up with. The best treatment plan is the one you'll do, right? Like that's what's most important, right? And so, yes, if I had it my way, every healthcare provider would have one goal when they're in the room with their client or their patient, and that is to find that person the answer to their problem. And, and if, that, if, if that includes, like, I feel the same way. If, if I don't feel I've got the answer to the person that I'm talking to, then my job is to find the person who does. Right. If I can do that, I've, I've done my job. I've delivered good health care, even though I, all I did was give them a phone number and point them in a direction, you know, talk to this person. Right. Um, and and I, I, I would just would want that every health care provider, regardless of where they are in the system. Right. And the um, Reiki provider don't care anywhere in between. Your goal is help your the person in front of you find the solution they need. And most of the time, that's not you. Like, it's just true. Like most of the time, most of the people who come in that I talk to do consults all day long, they, they don't need me. Some I can help. But if I'm doing my job well, I'm pointing them in the direction, my best sense of who can help them. 
And and I think th- like that should be that should be like the base of healthcare, right? Yeah, I, in my ideal world. Um, so uh, let's see. So you asked a, a great question, and I, I want to f- follow that um, to the end. So we've got our you know our our brick and mortar clinic here in Edina, Minnesota, where we can do the brain mapping. But then we've got our virtual clinic where we work with people all over, mostly North America, but you know, I have clients as far away as Germany, work with anybody, um, anywhere, where we use our devices. And so I'll just kind of, just quick kind of run through the devices. We got our favorite device, the audiovisual entrainment device, which is fantastic for you know, the whole range of mental health. So anxiety, depression, OCD, uh, traumatic brain injury, ADHD, dyslexia, um, we use it a lot in our neurodegenerative diseases. You know, people with Parkinson's have responded very well to audiovisual entrainment. So it's a great device for regulating the brain. And again, to me, all of these go back to brain-based issue. It's dysregulation. And what we want to do is regulate the dysregulation. And the audiovisual entrainment is a potent device for regulating dysregulation. That's why it works across multiple conditions. It's it's not magic. It's all conditions are dysregulation at the core. And so if we can make it that, we can make it better. Yeah. Is this device using a combination of light and sound therapy? Yep. So this is, um, yep, uh, lights for the eyes, uh, sounds for the ears, and then transcranial stimulation as well. So we have three modalities in one device. Yes. I think I I kind of think that I might have had the opportunity to use this device before in some previous things that I've done. My understanding was it was like twenty to thirty thousand dollars for the light. Ah, yes, yeah, so not not that device. Um, yes, yeah, so no, this this one is six hundred dollars, so it's very affordable. Um, yeah, I know it's crazy, right? I, I, I have to charge more. <laughs> yes. Well, with the story you told me before we came on, um, I'm already thinking I've got to send you one to help you recover from what you're going through right now. So, so yeah. So, and then, and then we also, we have for all of our devices, we have essentially a rental program so that people can try them and find out before they need to invest. Right. Because, you know, $600, there's a lot of people who $600 isn't a barrier for, but there's a lot of people who $600 is a barrier for. And, and so we really try and set up our program to cover the broadest swath of the population that we can and trying to, to not let money be the issue. People don't get care. Um, so, so yeah, so that's like, so that's one of our main devices, the audiovisual entrainment device. Love it. It's a first line treatment for so many things. So many people get better just with that device. But then we have um, our microcurrent device, which is microcurrent therapy, I'm a huge fan of it. Simple way to put it is think about a pharmacy, all of the different medications in a pharmacy, right? Hundreds of medications. For every pill, we have a protocol, right? So we, again, we think about we're electrochemical beings. Pharmaceuticals have handled the chemical side of the equation. Electroceuticals handle the electric side of the equation, right? So you might take a chemical anti-inflammatory, right? We would give you an electrical anti-inflammatory. So our little microcurrent box has hundreds of protocols in it that we would think of as like all little digital pills. And so if somebody has a sprain or a strain or a large intestine issue or a kidney issue or an eye issue, we, we have the protocol to treat that function or structure in the body with electricity as opposed to chemicals, right? Okay. So is this some is this something like the amp coil or like a Healy device? So, so, so similar to a Healy, um, so I use an, an Inspristar uh, uh, frequency specific microcurrent device. So that's Inspristar is the manufacturer. Um, and yeah, and then the protocols are kind of collectively derived or I custom write them for clients based on what's needed. But, but it is again, similar to a, to a Healy device, but 
different in interesting, um, sometimes meaningful ways. Um, so that's one of our devices. We've we've got a uh, infrared helmet that that can both put just put infrared light into the brain, but also it can do entrainment. So we can pulse the light to entrain neurons. So we can control brain function and brain physiology with that same device. We use that a lot in our neurodegenerative disease. So dementia, uh, Parkinson's, dystonia. Um, that's where it's a big feature. Um, so this differentiates between the other hel red light helmets that are out there being promoted for like hair regeneration. Okay. I, I just want to clarify that to the audience because I can see people run into Costco to buy that $99 thing that they have at the end of the aisle thinking that this is going to be the solution. Yes. Yes. So, so just, just a, 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 like a mo to spend a moment on the science, um, a red light will penetrate about five millimeters, right? Most of your visible lights will only penetrate a few millimeters so they don't get past the skin, right? Uh, near infrared will go about three inches. And then if you put a little more power behind it, you can get deeper. So we can get through the scalp uh, into the cortex at least, right? So a good near infrared helmet will cover most of the cortex and will get light, you know, into at least the penetrate the cortex. And then we use a nasal laser, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's two lasers you stick in your nose that we shine up to get light in the bottom of the brain. Right? So we come up through the nasal passageways, irradiate the blood in the nasal passageways, irradiate the eyes. So we treat things like macular degeneration. So I'm thinking all these people who have lost their sense of taste and smell in their olfactory center who are desperate, desperate. This, this could be like the solution. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's you know, again, you know, di different. Every person is different. Every physiology is different. We don't have you know, one key for everything. The nasal laser isn't for everybody, but no, I just heard from one of my, one of my clients that she was ecstatic. She reached out to say her sense of smell was back and she just can't believe it. She says like, like, yeah, she's like better than ever. And she's very excited. So yes, um, whether it's, whether it's, you know, uh, like a kind of a post COVID kind of olfactory bulb inflammation, you know, thing going on or more than that. It could be again, traumatic brain injury, people lose their sense of smell. Um, but also the same device, the nasal laser has ear lasers. So, um, you know, tinnitus, which is can be really, uh, you know, tenacious thing to treat. Again, is, is it, a, is it a solution to all tinnitus? No. Right. Then, how tinnitus arises is very different. Where it hangs out in a person's system is probably multi multi layered in terms of where the tinnitus is hanging out in the system. And so, for some people, the ear lasers fantastic, hearing loss, tinnitus, great. For other people, doesn't help. Um, but but that's the thing about these is again they're 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 the it's like they're tools and. You need a screwdriver, right? And more specifically, if you need a Phillips screwdriver, grab a Phillips screwdriver. But if you need a Robertson screwdriver, don't grab a flathead screwdriver, right? It doesn't work. It's like, it's in the category of screwdriver, but it's not gonna work. You gotta take the tool that does the job you need to do. And I would say to some degree, like that's the role of the clinician, right? Is to help determine like what is What's our best guess at the proper tool to shift this system towards health such that these things we call symptoms go away, right? And, and so these are the tools, right? Our, these are the tools we use. So the helmet, the nasal laser, the microcurrent, um, the audiovisual entrainment device, and then we have a, uh, a red or a red-blue light mouth guard for oral health. So people are struggling with different oral conditions, like you know, people going through chemo, oral mucositis, this is, this is a game changer for those folks. Like one of the, the things, I mean, it's terrible enough what's happening, you know, the, the cancer and the treatment, that's bad enough, but then you get the sores in your mouth and you can't eat and you, you know, then, then, then you have that, that series of problems. And if we can help a person, if the least we can do is just help them be able to eat and drink, um, like that is a valuable add to making it through the process of, of cancer.
I am so intrigued because I have not had solid food since December 4th. I had to have a mouth surgery from a massive bone degeneration within a three-month period that contributed to a pocket forming and infection setting in. So they had to go in, remove the bone and remove the gum and every, and it's bleeding profusely. I cannot get it to heal. So ironically enough, after this podcast, my next call was going to be to the dentist to say, what do I do? Like, it's still just bleeding uncontrollably. And more than anything, I'd love to be able to get back on a regular diet love food and my husband's an Italian chef. So I'm really missing out here, but everything you're like nailing everything. I'm like, okay, seriously, (laughs) we have to quit talking or else you're going to, you're going to keep developing conditions. That's no good. Right, right, right. (laughs) I'm bad for your health. Um, So for you, the two things I would, I would want for you would be the microcurrent so that we can work with a number of those things, the bone loss, the, the fact that it, it won't clot and stop bleeding, right? So we want, there's some tissue level stuff there. And then probably uh, like a blue red mouth guard, the blue is antimicrobial. So that will help, you know, like chances are right now you've been through rounds of antibiotics and, and oh, no antibiotics? So I, I won't do any antibiotics. And the reason that I won't do antibiotics is because the last time that I chose to go on antibiotics, it ended up leading to SIBO. And I totally did not listen to my intuition that told me this was only going to make things more complicated. So that has also fed into the plethora of problems. Sure. Okay. So did they do anything for the, the infection? Yeah, they gave me lots of prescriptions that I did not fill. Okay, so they they did something, you did. Okay. Yes, but I was very transparent and let them know, you know, um, that I was not willing to go that route unless it was absolutely necessary. So um, you uh, had Dr. Drobot on a few days ago, who's fantastic, love him. Um, so maybe a trip to his Scottsdale clinic for some ozone therapy, right? To, to try and naturally um, undermine the infection, whatever may or may not be left there. Um, and then you're gonna ask him about um, his um, hemolumen for the, the, the uh, cleansing the blood. Yep. And so, you know, there's two ways, kind of very natural, health oriented, not anti anything, no, right? It's all pro vitality to try and optimize for your mouth to heal. And then, so that's on the, like, that's, that's the, like, that's the healthcare adventure. That's your healthcare retreat. Go see Dr. Drobot in Scottsdale and, and have some of his magic treatments. They're fantastic. Um, uh, but then on a simpler level, my side kind of at home would be microcurrent and a red blue mouth guard, red to to stimulate the tissues towards healing, vitalize the tissues, get them regenerating. And blue is an antimicrobial. Wow. I'm telling you, I am just absolutely blown away uh, really with you and your expertise, your ability to articulate it. Uh, I, I wish that all healthcare practitioners had your perception of the healthcare experience. I know that I would sign up. I will sign up in a heartbeat to have an opportunity to work with you. You've already, you know, I've I'm already bought in fully in terms of trust and and truly the feel that I get from you is that it's really about the person and and helping to get the person feeling better. That's the reason to get up and go to work every day. Right? Is that how do we help people have happier lives to realize more of their potential. I'm going to just be so honest. I am so honored to have you today on the show and to be able to have had this conversation and really give the audience a true feel for a practitioner who is determined to serve the person. I mean, wow.
my heart, my little electromagnetic field inside my heart is just radiating with just pure love for the mission and the passion that you have for the work that you do. And I feel blessed that I was connected with you to have this conversation. And more importantly, I just feel so blessed to be able to share this with the audience. Truly, I am so grateful for your time. So with with all of that said, how can the audience connect with you and learn more details about your services, especially the virtual services if they are not in Minnesota? Sure. So um, probably the simpler website to look at is cerebralfit.com, right? So just cerebralfit.com, all one. Uh, the other would be uh, the Bhakti Wellness Center. So that always trips people up, Bhakti, B-H-A-K-T-I. So bhakticlinic.com will be our website. So we can go to bhakticlinic.com and, and, and learn more about the, the brick and mortar uh, clinic and, and all the services we offer. But cerebralfit.com will be our virtual clinic where we use the devices and, and you know, mostly treat conditions um, virtually with bioelectric medicine. Wow. I will make sure to attach that in the show notes so it makes it easy for people to be able to connect with you in those services. So I would love for you to leave the listeners with just one tip, your favorite tip, the one thing, your non-negotiable that you live by on a daily basis. Oh, man. That is a lot of pressure. One, boy, I don't know if I can do one because, you know, <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. So, um, you know, hug a friend. Yep. Um, hug an animal. Meditate. All valuable, valuable tips that we all need to make time to do more of, especially under our current Worldwide circumstances, we all need to just take a step back, take a deep breath, give a hug, hug our pets, and just let the mind go. A little co-regulation. Well, I'll tell you, this conversation has been very co-regulatory for me today. It's just been so refreshing. I truly appreciate you and your time. Uh, I could not thank you. I, I Seriously, I just can't thank you enough for this today. Thank you, Heather. It's been fun. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. Do me a favor. And if you loved this episode, please go leave a review. Reviews help make sure that this content reaches more people so that we can continue to heal as a collective. Remember to take a screenshot that you're listening and tag us on Instagram at Heather Barbieri RDN for a 15% discount on the Retrain Your Brain program. See you next time.